All right, good morning, everybody. It's still morning, right? Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be looking at the second commandment this morning, which is verses 4 through 6. Our focus is going to be on verse 4. The title to our message is The Messiah and the Second Word. So Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word says that um, when you speak, it does not return unto you void, just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and cause grass and trees to grow. So Lord, we know that your word will cause us to grow. Help us to anticipate that now with faith. Fill us with your spirit for Jesus' name's sake, we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So here we are moving into the second commandment. And I think for a lot of us, the uh, immediate question is, is how is the second commandment different from the first commandment? After all, if a person worships an idol, aren't they in fact worshiping another god? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, And we're actually going to see overlap like this in all of the commandments. In the New Testament, it tells us that if someone is covetous, a violation of the 10th commandment, that they're committing idolatry, which is a violation of the second commandment. That's Colossians 3.5. And so this raises the question, are there really differences in the commandments themselves? Is there a difference between the first commandment and the second commandment? And the answer is yes. We can sum it up this way. The first commandment tells us who we should worship, namely the triune God alone. And the second commandment tells us how we should worship, namely without images. So let's look to our exposition. Look at verse four with me, please says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, a carved image. In the ancient Near East, worshipers would carve an image out of wood, or they would sculpt it out of stone, or later they would cast it into metal. Uh, The NASB translates this Hebrew word, fasel, as idol. Uh, You shall not make for yourself an idol, maybe some of your translations say. And this physical idol represented the God that was being worshipped. That's implied in the next clause in verse 4. Or any likeness of anything. Likeness is, uh, it means form or shape or manifestation or representation. And this point is really, really important to understand because The pagans in the ancient world, they didn't approach their idols thinking that those idols were gods. Um, They believed that these idols represented their gods. And we'll get to more on that in just a bit. But why does God forbid um, idol worship in the second commandment? What is it precisely that he forbids? Well, he doesn't forbid ordinary artwork. I know some of you children, boys and girls, you love to draw. God is not forbidding us to draw or to paint or to sculpt, generally speaking. And nor is it wrong for God to make an image of himself. I mean, we've seen this again and again and again in Genesis 1, right? That God made us in his image, Genesis 1, 28. And furthermore, every time uh, parents procreate, that image is reproduced. But humans, in contrast, says E.H. Merrill, may not fashion God, 
in the image of humans or in the image of anything else. Look at the end of uh, verse 4. This is what it says. No idol is to be made of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, that is a sweeping statement. It's not the first sweeping statement that we've seen. In verse, um, in verse 2, it says that God declares that he is the God over the nations, right? That's why he could deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt because he's God of Egypt. He's God of Israel. He was God of every single nation. And here, as Robert Older says, God is declaring that he is God over the cosmos, not just over the nations, over every single realm that exists, heaven, earth, and under the sea. Now, remember, in the plagues, I know that seemed like such a long time ago to you guys, but in the plagues, what did we see? Well, God defeated Hopi, the god of the Nile. He defeated Heket, the goddess of frogs. In Egypt, what we saw is that these gods had power over these different realms. And here, God is declaring that um, no idol is to be made of me from any realm because I am Lord over every realm. This is a huge difference. This is a huge distinction between the gods of Egypt and the God of Scripture. But there are other reasons why God forbids idols. We're going to see one of them next week, God willing, in verse 5. But let's look at um, Moses' commentary on this passage. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses is looking back at Mount Sinai 40 years later. And now he's giving us a reason why we should not make images of God. So Deuteronomy 4 is essentially a commentary on the second commandment. So let's look at verse 11. Here's a reason why God forbids images of himself. Verse 11, and you, Israel, came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. When, as the children of Israel are hearing the second commandment, fire is on the mountain. They hear the words. They see no form. Why is that so vital? I mean, children, boys and girls, ask yourself for a second. Was God like hiding behind the mountain? Is that why they couldn't see his form? No, not at all. Uh, they didn't see his form because God is infinite and incomprehensible. He is the eternal spirit. A uh, hen. hen Henrik Bollinger this week, I was reading this, and this is what he said. He said, God is immeasurable, incomprehensible, unspeakable, all over and everywhere, filling heaven and earth, eternal, living, giving life unto all, preserving everything, and lastly, of a glorious majesty exalted above the heavens. When we get to the New Testament, Paul says it like, like this, that God dwells in unapproachable light. No one can see him. No one has seen him. And this is, I mean, we live in Boise, Idaho, so I have to say this. This is one of the strongest arguments against the false god of Mormonism. Uh, go to their website. See for yourself. They say that God the Father has a body just like you and me. And what they're saying is, is that God is limited to time and space. Their God is a creature. The reason why God didn't have a form is because he's not a creature. The true God has no form precisely because no form could ever represent him. Uh, he says this through the Isaiah the prophet later on. He says, all the nations are as nothing before him. They're accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness? To whom then will you liken God? If, if, if the nations are like dust, what are we going to do? Form some dust and say, this is God? 
It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One, Isaiah 40. So to represent God in any form is to rob him of deity. God is incomparable. Any form that we would ascribe to him would rob him of his utter uniqueness. But there is more here. In the ancient world, idol worshipers believed three things about their idols. They believed that idols were divine incarnations, that they were divine mediators, and that they were divine redeemers. So let's look at those three things. First, idols were believed to be divine incarnations, divine incarnations. Desmond Alexander says here, quote, while images portrayed certain qualities or attributes of their deity, their primary purpose was not to describe the God. Rather, the image was one of the primary places where the God manifested itself. Their gods were viewed as being present in the idol. So scholar Amy um, Belogi says here, the incarnation um, of a cosmic deity. So these idols were incarnations of cosmic deities. Secondly, idols were believed to be divine mediators. Again, Belogi says here, the physical core of the idol is envisioned as an axis mundi connecting heaven and earth. I know that's Latin. I had to look it up. I don't know Latin, but that phrase, axis mundi, it means this connection between heaven and earth, between God and men. These, these type of idols were often formed like a tower or like a ladder. Now, where have we seen towers before in Scripture? What is it? Where? The Tower of Babel. This was like the first prime example of idolatry. They built this tower as an axis mundi, as a connection between heaven and earth. And, and just a, a, a few chapters later in Genesis 28, though it's, though it's not an, an idol, a pagan idol, God gives Jacob this vision of this ladder that connects heaven and earth. It's like this divine conduit. This is precisely what they saw in these idols, that this was the way that we accessed. It was like a portal almost to access heaven. Thirdly, idols were believed to be redeemers or saviors. Recall how... Uh, God often ridicules um, idol worshipers, especially in the book of Isaiah. He, he says, you know, the, the, these idol worshipers, they have a tree. <laughs> they use half of the tree to cook and warm themselves while the rest of it they make into a God. They bow down, they worship, and they say, deliver me for you are my God. Isaiah forty four seventeen. Deliver me. We're going to see this coming up. In chapter 32 of Exodus, the reason why Israel made the golden calf, they were nervous because Moses had disappeared on the mountain for 40 days. They didn't know if he was coming back. The reason why they made a golden calf is because as they were looking at the promised land, they believed we need a God to deliver us. We need a God to go with us, make the golden calf. So those three things are the itch that idol worship, is, idol worship is scratching. Idol worship promises divine incarnation, divine mediation, and divine redemption. So hopefully you can see right away that all idols are messianic in nature. By definition, by, the, the, by their nature, they're messianic. So that brings us then to our, our doctrine. Do you see why God hates idols with such violence? 
Um, not only do, do idols demote him to a creaturely status, but they necessarily supplant the role of Messiah. Um, they, they promise things that only the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, can provide for us. And so that's our doctrine. In the second commandment, God forbids all images of himself, but has provided the perfect image of himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Loved ones, the second commandment is looking forward to the New Testament, where God provides for us the only image of himself in Christ. This is what the scripture says, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. What did Jesus say in the upper room? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's talking about the eyes of your heart. If you've seen my glory, you've seen the Father. So consider three glories of Jesus being made in the image of God. Three glories of how Jesus fulfills the longing of every human heart. Glory number one. As the image of God, Christ is the only incarnation of God. Christ is the only incarnation of God. Loved ones, idol worshipers are longing for something that all human beings long for. They're longing for the presence of the divine. Idols give the illusion that Emmanuel, that God is with us, that God is incarnate. But in Jesus Christ, this is precisely what God has given us. Please turn with me to John chapter 1. Anybody can see where I'm going at this point. This is not difficult to see. Starting in verse 1 in John 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then that glorious turn in verse 14 where it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Loved ones, the Word became flesh. The Word became incarnate. God, the divine, came down, Emmanuel, God with us, God present with man. That's what all idol worshipers are, 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 are seeking for. They're longing for, if I could only be close to God, that's what God did in Christ by making him put on flesh. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Glory number two. As the image of God, Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Christ is the only mediator mediator. Please turn with me to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. Here Paul is telling us what we should pray for, who we should pray for, but look how he grounds this. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul says this, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For, here's the ground, there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, God is telling us to pray for those who are in positions of authority because there's only one way that they will be saved and it's through this one mediator. That word mediator um, in Latin, medius, it means middle. Jesus is the middle ground. He is the bridge. He is the connector that joins heaven and earth. In other words, I mean, maybe you've seen this as you, you read through the book of Genesis, but that whole vision that, that Jacob has of the ladder that's connecting heaven to earth, that's Jesus. He is Jacob's ladder. And, and Jesus says this in John 1 51, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and you will see the angels of God descending 
and ascending on the Son of Man. He's the ladder connecting heaven and earth. The Geneva Bible says here, Christ is the ladder whereby God and men are joined together and by whom the angels minister to us. All graces by him are given to us and we by him ascend into heaven. You know, the scripture actually gives us great pictures of what Jesus accomplishes for us if we'll just open our eyes to it. Jesus is a ladder. That's weird. No, it's not. He's connecting heaven and earth. Through him, God came down. Through him, we will go up to God. Glory number three. As the image of God, Christ is the only redeemer of God's elect. The only redeemer of God's elect. In the same passage, look at verse 6. He gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus is the redeemer because Jesus is the ransom. Children, boys and girls, uh, do you know what a ransom is? A ransom is that payment which releases prisoners. So do you remember what the ransom payment was for Israel on how they were delivered out of Egypt, out of their bondage there? Does anybody remember? That's right. That's right, young child. (laughs) It was the Passover lamb. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, The Passover lamb was slain. That was the ransom. On that very night, the Israelites were freed. And don't, don't you see, as we get into the New Testament, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. The ransom payment was made. We're set free from our sins. When he was raised again from the dead, the angel declared, he has risen, securing our righteousness and our eternal glory with God. He's the ransom payment, the redeemer. Now, loved ones, all of that to say, that's why idolatry is forbidden because idols promise to be your substitute Messiah. They promise to give you those three things. They promise to be God incarnate for you, some presence of the divine. They, they promise that he, this thing could be your mediator. This, this thing will help me connect to heaven. And, it'll, and they promise to be your redeemer, to rescue you, to deliver you. They steal glory from Christ. These things are only found in him. So that's our doctrine. In the second commandment, God forbids all images of himself, but has provided the perfect image of himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. So then let's look at application. And it is Reformation Sunday. So I hope, I hope that this next point here on application will challenge you, challenge you to reform what you think because it's challenged me. I want to talk about images of Christ, whether in film or in art. This is something that is all around us in culture, in popular movies and TV series and picture books. Does the second commandment speak to images of Christ? Well, the larger catechism um, says, yes, it does. Listen to what the larger catechism says. Question 109, what sins are forbidden in the second commandment? And one sin, it says, is making any representation of God, of any or all of the three persons, either inwardly in our mind or outwardly in any kind of image or likeness. So according to the shorter catechism, images of Christ are sinful. And I just want to start, first of all, by asking for, for your forgiveness. Loved ones, I've had images of Christ up recently, in, in recent months, in my office. I've told many of you that I've watched like the Chosen series. Um, I'm sorry for setting a wrong, a wrong example. Please forgive me. Um, I've changed my mind on this, and, and I would ask for you to just think critically with me for a moment. Let's consider this issue Uh, of images of Christ from history. In the 8th century, 
uh, there was a controversy called the iconoclast controversy. Icons, pictures of Christ and other religious figures, was a hotly debated issue. The Eastern Church believed and, and still believes today that these icons, these pictures, uh, are the place where heaven and earth unite. Um, historian Nick Needham says here, quote, they saw icons as the place where heaven and earth unite, sacred meeting places with the spiritual world, manifestations of Christ's presence. Now, doesn't that sound exactly like the way that idol worshipers viewed their idols? In the end, this issue of, of icons split the church into the east and in the west in, in 787 at the Second Council of Nicaea, and they've never been joined back together. This is one of the differences between the Protestant church and the, the Eastern Orthodox church or the Protestant church and the, the Catholic church. Loved ones, we are, uh, we, we are reformed. We're solidly in that camp, and the reformed witness has been against pictures of Christ. That's been the majority view. Now, someone might say to me, um, but Pastor Josh, I don't worship pictures of Christ in print or in movies. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just art. It's just drama. Well, that was precisely my argument. Um, But Edward Clowney uh, tersely points out, to look at Jesus' face is to worship him. Just... Think about that for a second and ask yourself these questions. Do images of Jesus bring you to worship? If not, then why do you have them? If if so, if they do bring you to worship, then isn't that image worship? Furthermore, as Dr. McGraw points out, do we really want to say we're training ourselves to think about Jesus through these pictures, through these images, without worshiping him. These images are either idolatrous or vain because they're not stirring us to worship, or they are. Secondly, let's consider this issue just from pure reason. Think about this syllogism for a second. Premise number one, God forbade making images of himself. Premise number two, Christ is God. Conclusion, Christ, God forbade making images of Christ. Um, Now, someone, again, might say, well, wait a second, Christ is a human person. It's not wrong to depict human persons. But, But, loved ones, Jesus is not merely a human person. Um, to, to, say that, uh, to say that he is merely a human person, that, that's the, the heresy of Nestorianism. Nestorianism taught that the divine person was divided from the human person. In other words, as we're looking at um, Jesus Christ, there is a human person and a divine person. That's not what the, the hypostatic union is. We say that he has two natures, truly God, truly man, united in one person forever. Since Christ is the God-man, since he's not merely a man, the second commandment would forbid us from making images of him. And someone might say, well, why does this even matter? Um, Aren't you getting a little personal as we're talking about my own images in my own house? Well, this is the second commandment. (laughs) That's really the question. What does the second commandment say? Um, remember, images of God lie about who God is. Habakkuk 2.18 says that idols are teachers of lies. The reason why Israel didn't see a form on the mountain is because God is infinite. To make him a finite thing is to lie about him. Now, just isn't it interesting to you that we don't have any drawings of Jesus from people who lived at his time? I mean, he was the most famous man in history. We actually do have pictures of Julius Caesar and other historical figures because artists of those time drew pictures of them. Yet it is no accident that the Bible never gives us a description, a vivid description of Jesus. Images of Jesus tell untrue things about the Son of God. 
No matter what picture or video or whatever, it's going to distort or reduce him in some way. Maybe ways too subtle for us to even understand. Only in heaven will we see the God-man united in one person in the way that God intended us to see him. Now, loved ones, we actually do have images of Christ every Sunday in word and in sacrament. Um, In the word, we see Jesus. This is exactly what Paul told the Galatian church in Galatians 3.1. He says, it was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Before your eyes, meaning that as they heard the word preached, the eyes of their heart beheld Christ. And the same thing is true in the sacrament. In baptism this morning, we saw a drama of Christ washing these children. In the Lord's Supper, we're going to see Christ holding him in our hand and drinking him with the wine. Those are the images that God has intended for us regarding Christ. Now, I do want to help those of you who have vivid imagination. Someone might say, what about images of Jesus in my mind? I can't help it. Every time I read scripture, I visualize everything. We were having a debate with my son over this. Like he's a hyper visualizer. And he every time he reads, he's seeing everything he's reading. And and Monica and I are like, I I I I just don't have that problem. I, I guess I'm not very imaginative. Um, but I have I have two answers for that. First, first. Every commandment of God requires perfect obedience in our minds, in our hearts, and in our behavior. That they require perfect obedience is proof that they come from God, a perfect God, an infinite God. You and I, we're going to get done with the Ten Commandments, and all it's going to do is heighten our knowledge of our sin. That is the point of the Ten Commandments, one point of the Ten Commandments, that where the law came, it increased the trespass, and where the trespass increased, grace abounded all the more. As we look at these commands, we're going to say, man, I am way worse than I thought I was. That's what they're intended to do to drive you to Jesus. However, there are things... In Scripture, I would say, that we ought not to visualize. This is pretty easy. Um, In Genesis 4.1, it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife. Should we use self-discipline and not visualize that? Yes. So there are things, and I would say, including the image of Christ, that we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us to not visualize those things. All right, thus ends that Reformation part of our talk. As as we begin our our descent, I do want us just to ask the question, why does humanity turn to idols? Why do you turn to idols? Why Why do I turn to idols? This isn't a problem only in the ancient world. Idolatry is the, the disease of the human heart. Um, our go-to problem every day is idolatry. The reason why you're anxious is because you're an idolater. The reason why you're scared is because you struggle with idols. These idols promise us the very things that we need most. They, they promise a presence of the divine. They promise to deal with our guilt and shame. They promise to deliver us. In other words, idols are promising to be our Messiah. None of this is is theoretical at all. Loved ones, uh, my flesh right now is constantly being tempted to fear. And and in this this last week especially, I've given into it a bit. This, This potential lawsuit that is coming against me my uh, son's mental health, uh, uh, our future grandchildren, my precious wife, all of those things are being threatened. And I know that many of you are in the midst of great trials. I know you. You've lost your husband due to death or due to sin. 
you've lost your wife or you're currently losing your wife. Children, some of you right now are without a father or a mother because of some affliction in your life. Some of you are facing a health crisis or a crisis of finances or a crisis of faith. Our nation is facing a crisis of existence. And we need relief. We need relief. And, and loved ones, isn't that what all of us need? We, we need the presence of the divine. We need uh, relief from our guilt. We need deliverance. And, and that's precisely why we turn to idols. Because we say things like this, just a, a little bit money, more money will fix my problems. Or we say, alcohol will help me escape. Or we say, well, these sexual encounters help me feel alive. Or we say, well, a good lawyer will save me. Or we say, virtuous living will help my troubled conscience. Or we say, a better job will make me right. Or if I find a spouse that loves me, I will finally have what I'm looking for. Or just fill in the blank, loved ones. If I just had fill in the blank, then I would be okay. We turn to idols because they promise to be Messiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 46. Look at the subtitle here. The idols of Babylon and the one true God. This chapter speaks of the fall of Babylon and what became of her idols when the Persian Empire defeated them. Look at verse 1. Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Matthew Poole notes here that Bel was the chief idol of the Babylonians. He was called by profane historians Jupiter Belus. And Nebo, another of the famous idols which used to deliver oracles. They were at the height of the Babylonian Empire. But when the Persians conquered Babylon, what were these idols doing? Bel was bowing, Nebu was stooping. The Babylonians used to uh, bow to Bel and Nebo, hoping them to deliver, but now these idols were bowing when they were defeated. But there's more. Look at this next clause. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. Verse 2, they stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. So instead of these idols carrying them through affliction, these Babylonians had to carry their idols. And loved ones, this is precisely the witness of history. Augustine in the city of God recounts how when the Romans defeated the Greeks, the Grecian gods could not carry them. And then when the Gauls defeated the Romans, the Roman idols could not carry them. Do you see yourself in this story, loved ones? Which idol can deliver you? Which idol has ever faithfully carried you? So where you got done with that idol and, and you said to yourself, man, that was a pleasant experience. Never, never. Now look at what Yahweh promises for his people. In verse three, listen to me, O house of Jacob, listen, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Do you, do you see the play on words here? The Babylonians had to carry their idol, and the Lord of Israel now says, I have carried you, and he gives them three instances of carrying them. First, um, and these instances encompass the past and the future. First, he says, I carried you from the womb, uh, which probably means ever since they left Egypt, 
when they were born as a nation, God has been carrying them. We just sang that, that how I carried you on eagle's wings. That's from Exodus chapter 19. This is tender imagery. Yahweh is carrying Israel when they were but helpless children. But then he looks to their future in verse four. Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. <laughs> he says, I carried you when you were helpless children, and I will carry you when you are helpless geriatrics. I will carry you from the beginning to the end, and then I will carry you every part in between. At the end of verse four, I have made, I will bear, I will carry, and will save. He's telling Israel, there's never been a time where I will not carry you. And then he connects it to the second commandment. In verse five, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Loved ones, the triune God is not like anything that your heart is tempted to trust in. He's incomparable. He, he's promising that he'll carry us. Has he not carried us from the womb? In fact, has he not carried us from eternity past? Ephesians 1.4 says that even he has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world, before you were ever a thought in your mother's mind, God was carrying you in eternity past. Has he not carried us on the cross? Jesus was carrying you when he went to Calvary in Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He promises to carry us all the way until the end of the line. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So loved ones, I charge you today, turn away from counterfeit messiahs. In the end, you're going to have to carry them. In the end, you're going to have to deliver them. Leave them. Look to the true Messiah, the incarnate God. He became Emmanuel, God with us. Look to the Messiah. He is the one mediator. He is the one that can remove all of your guilt and shame. Look to Christ, the Redeemer, the one ransom for your sins, past, present, and future. He will deliver us from every enemy, from every cancer cell, from every devil. When all of our hairs are gray and our flesh has failed us, he'll still be carrying us all the way into glory. Look to Christ, the one true image of the invisible God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would do this work in us. The children of Israel heard the second commandment, and then within just a few days, they broke it. Lord, we know that we do often the same thing. Even today, we can leave this place and start immediately worrying and being filled with anxiety and fear that you won't carry us and we'll be tempted to turn to other things that we think would carry us. And so, God, we are helpless to obey this commandment without the power of your Holy Spirit. So come, Father, cause your Spirit to fall upon us. Fill us, as we just read in Acts 5, that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke truth. Help us to be filled with your Spirit, that we would think truth, believe truth, and act truth. And we all pray all these things for the glory of your name. Amen.